So thank you very much, Michelle. Um, so once again, my name is Matt Makauka. Um, I've kind of been a fixture at the McDermott Library. Um, coming up soon, I'll be there. Be, I'll have been working there for about 19 years, um, and I've worn many hats there. Um, I cover a multitude of subjects. So as Michelle mentioned, I'm the library liaison or um, what might uh, resonate better with you, uh, the subject specialist for the School of Arts and Technology and um, Emerging Media. In fact, I actually ended up getting a second master's out of that school. So I'm very close to a lot of the faculty there. Um, then I've also been um, subject specialist to the ECS school and all of the different sub-disciplines and sub-schools um, associated with that one. Um, and then I'm also the subject specialist for, um, this kind of ties into my um, academic background as an undergrad um, with the um, subject specialist for the philosophy department out of A&H. Um, anyway, that aside, Today's presentation is going to introduce you to the concept of the H-index. Um, it is a metric for measuring a scholar or scientist's impact and um, how you can calculate it using um, library databases. In particular, we're going to look at one called Scopus and another one called Web of Science. Those are kind of the main ones for doing that. Um, but we'll also look at how you can calculate it using Google Scholar. Um, I want to begin by defining what exactly we mean um, by an H-index and, uh, and look at its intended purpose and benefits. Um, then we'll go into, I'll go into demoing how to do it with those various tools, Scopus, Web of Science, and so on. Um, after that, um, I'm going to conclude by then addressing um, various controversies and shortcomings of the H-index. Um, it's simple, um, but simple is not perfect or complete. So, um, so it's got its pluses and minuses. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, and then after the presentation, which should be fairly short, so we are not going to eat up the whole um, one hour of time, um, should run around probably 30 minutes, uh, maybe a little longer than that, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A after that. Okay, so let's see here. Bear with me. Well, let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, forgive me, this is my first Zoom presentation, so I'm kind of working through it. All right. So, the H index, what is it? Uh, an H index is a score that attempts to measure both the productivity and citation impact of the published body of work of a scientist or scholar. It is based on the set of the scientists most cited papers and the number of citations those papers have received in other publications. Um, it was first introduced in 2005 by a scientist by the name of Jorge E. Hirsch. He's a physicist at UC San Diego, and it is sometimes um, referred to as the Hirsch Index or Hirsch Number. So that's what, what the H stands for. Um, the H Index serves as an, as an alternative to the more traditional journal impact factor metrics um, used in the evaluation of impact of a particular researcher. Hirsch intended the H Index to address the main disadvantages of other bibliometric indicators. For example, total number of papers alone uh, that a author publishes or the total number of times he's been cited. Total number of papers does not account for the quality of scientific publications, while total number of citations can be disproportionately affected by participation in a single publication of major influence. In other words, kind of that rock star publication that gets tons of citations and then anything else they published didn't. Um, so it tries not to get skewed by that or by having many publications with few citations each. So the H index is intended to measure simultaneously the quality and quantity of uh, 
of an author's output, which it does to varying degrees of success, we will see as we go forward. Um, that said, um, we will address those criticisms and shortcomings, like I said, later on um, towards the end of this presentation. So simply put, the H index is based on the distribution of citations received by a given researcher's publications. So a scholar with an index of H has published H papers each of which have been cited in other papers at least H times. So to repeat, the H index reflects both the number of publications and number of citations per publication. Um, one thing to keep in mind with the H index is that um, it works properly only for comparing scientists or authors in the same field because citation conventions differ wild, widely among different fields. So uh, computer science can't be um, compared, for example, against um, biomedical engineering, but we'll get into those details um, again the further we go in. Okay, so I just touched upon all those um, advantages and don't worry, um, I will um, pass along the, um, the PowerPoint and my notes, which are far more detailed than these. Um, to everyone who has signed up, so um, you'll have copies of those. So, um, how can we calculate it? So that's actually quite the, the simple part. Um, the H index can be determined using citation databases such as Scopus and Web of Science and the ever popular Google Scholar. So, I just wanna make a, a quick um, Disclaimer before I go into demoing each of these. Depending on the tool that you use, each is likely to produce a different H index for the same scholar. This is because every tool varies in the number and kind of publications it covers. Uh, for the most part, H index is um, calculated for um, journal publications. So articles published in journals, um, and uh, times they've been cited in other journals. But sometimes, just depending on the tool you're using, that can extend to other types of publications. So for instance, the Web of Science has strong coverage of journal publications, but poor coverage of high impact conferences. This exclusion can negatively impact certain disciplines, such as computer science, where conference proceedings are considered a vital part of the literature. Scopus, on the other hand, has superior coverage of conference proceedings uh, compared to Web of Science, but coverage of publications prior to 1996 tends to be kind of spotty. So um, if you're looking at the H index of a, of a recent scholar who's only just been publishing in the last couple of decades, for example, then uh, this limitation in Scopus may not really present any problems but for a longer historical look at a scholar or author um, who's got um, a set of publications going back decades and decades, then Web of Science actually has better historical coverage. Um, and then lastly, Google Scholar um, has, uh, the far reach, has far reaching coverage in both conferences and most, but not all journals. You will see that with um, all of these databases, there just isn't one single one that covers everything. Um, that said, as much as, as sweeping as Google Scholar is, um, it too has its drawbacks similar to Scopus. Um, its coverage of pre-1990 publications is spotty and incomplete. Um, again, just depends on what person you're trying to calculate the H index for. That may not be a problem for you. Um, and then for good or bad, another major issue with Google Scholar is that it, it tends to inflate the author's H index based on a variety of factors. Um, for one, it covers more but not necessarily better publications, uh, which includes books, patents and select web, web publications, um, such as those that come out of um, archive, 
arxiv.org. Um, whereas, um, to repeat, Scopus and Web Assignments limit themselves to um, primarily to journals and some conference proceedings. Um, and Google Scholar um, has no way to filter out those um, other outside documents. Um, it also lacks a stringent system for removing duplicate entries. So the same article may have two entries because of um, erroneous metadata to it. Same article, but the author's name is spelled differently on one um, than the other. So, um, so it looks like he's got twice as much as what's there. So in a way, that person gets overcounted in that um, regard. And so it's bad for deduplicating. Um, also, Google Scholar lacks a filter for ignoring the impact of self-citations. Um, and that is one way that one can kind of game the H index system um, and boost their H index. Okay, so with that said, I am going to, let's see here, get out of, there we go, head over to uh, my web browser. And we're going to start with um, Scopus and Web of Science. So um, if you're not too familiar with the library's um, page and getting to our databases, um, just a quick overview. So you can get to us, it's just the UT Dallas address and then add slash library and that will bring you to our page um, if you are on the university's home page. Um, we're also under academics and we have a dedicated button there for library just brings you to the same place. And it's going to default to a discover search. Now there's a number of ways to reach our databases. I'm just going to show you one. Matt, um, what, what you want to do is... Uh, Matt, head, yes. I, I hate to interrupt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm still seeing your PowerPoint slide on the screen. Oh, uh oh, okay. Let's see here. Um, Better? Yes, looks good on my end. Uh, okay. We have a comment here about stopping to share the screen first and then to switch over. Okay. Okay, thank All you. Right. Yes. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. Hey, it's a learning experience for all of us. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, so to access the library databases, um, again, that's just um, our URL, the university's URL, you add slash library. So utdallas.edu slash library. Um, it defaults to our all-in-one discover search uh, where you want to go to access these databases though. Um, I, I would direct you um, the fourth tab down, the one that says databases. And um, as long as you know the name of the database you want, just go to the corresponding letter so we're going to go to, to S for Scopus. And for this one, I'm going to right click to access it. And being off campus, um, it would prompt me for my net ID and password and let me in. And then it defaults to their document search. So uh, think of Scopus and when we look at Web of Science as well, as specialized search engines um, that restrict narrowly to scholarly publications, uh, for the most part, journal uh, publications. In the case of Scopus, it does both conference proceedings and journals. Web Science is um, almost exclusively journals. Um, and uh, both have um, very heavy coverage of the sciences. Uh, so all of your hard sciences, social sciences, business, uh, those types of things. These two, though, are not good databases if you're doing um, arts and humanities research. Okay, so uh, to calculate the H index with Scopus, um, I would advise going to an author search. So you would click on that button. And then um, I'm going to use um, a professor that's been with us a long time um, at UTD, uh, Dr. Katarnabaz. Um, he deals with medical imaging, um, machine learning, um, 
a lot of electrical engineering and computer science um, type topics. So you want the full last name and then you can put in either the full first name or the first initial. So this is uh, his first name's Nasser. I'm just going to put in N. Um, if you should happen to have an ORCID ID for uh, the author, that's kind of like an unambiguous uh, single number for an author. So if two authors share the same name, um, that can cause problems with trying to filter just for their publications um, in these tools. So one way to, uh, to narrow, to disambiguate to just the author you want is to use their ORCID ID if they have uh, signed up for one. So if you happen to have that number, and sometimes you'll see that attached to articles that you run across, then you can use that um, instead of the name. Okay, and I will go ahead and search. And this is telling me that I've got two results. So um, notice here, in the middle of the page, um, first entry is Nasser D. Katarnavaz with 289 documents. Um, then he's got a separate listing um, with just Nasser Katarnavaz, no D, and 40 documents, um, both University of Texas at Dallas. So clearly these are both the same person. So um, just again, depending on who you're researching, um, to be thorough, um, and it just depends on how um, their data was attached to each of their publications, you may need to select several of them to put together. And then what I will do is go to the View Citation Overview. And so it's going to add those together and uh, it gives me um, a small line graph um, depicting the last few years. So kind of see um, how he was trending with how often he's been cited. Now I'll warn you, um, this little um, graph only extends to 15 years. And Dr. Katarnavaz has been publishing since the 80s. And so there's a limitation there on, on what it can display. That said, it is, as far as um, calculating the H index, it is going through um, all of the documents. So all years. So for him, um, you'll see up here in the upper right corner, it says author H index 31. And then there's the view H graph. So I'll click that so you can get a visualization of that. So there's his H index of 31. Now I should point out, I kind of mentioned this earlier when briefly describing the differences between the different tools. Um, with Scopus and Web of Science, um, if you want, you can exclude, um, apply different filters. So in this case, um, if he's, say, trying to game the system by self-citing himself a lot in his papers, well, we can click the exclude self and update. And notice that did bring it down a number. Um, there are some book publications included. So if you wanted to just uh, stick strictly to journals and proceedings, not books, well, we can apply that filter as well. Okay, and that really didn't change it. So it's still stuck it at 30. So uh, pretty straightforward there. Um, with Scopus, just go into an author search. Search um, If there's multiple entries, just make sure you add them together and um, then analyze the author's output. And then that should generate the H index on the fly. Are we doing okay so far? Yes, Matt, moving right along. Thank okay. you. Um, so we'll take, now we can, um, let's compare this to a search on Web of Science. So just to repeat, if you come into our page, look for that fourth tab down, green, databases, and we'll go to W for Web of Science. And Matt, before we move to the next one, we have a question. Oh, sure. Um, what number is good and what does 30 indicate? 
Well, that is quite the loaded question. Um, it depends um, on the, the field or discipline that you're researching. So um, within Dr. Katarnavaz's um, field, which I believe is, is electrical engineering, um, I think that's pretty good. I've heard um, one scientist um, joke on a, on a YouTube um, video demonstration that um, a, an H index that matches your age is a good one. Um, I don't know, that, that seems rather arbitrary. Um, but you tend to have um, in the sciences much higher numbers and, um, and then in the um, arts and humanities really low numbers. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, they aren't, you can't compare across disciplines. So a 25 in biomedical engineering um, does not mean the same thing as a 25 in computer science. So you kind of have to look at them in context. Um, off the top of my head, um, I don't know if, um, if well, I, since Dr. Katarnavaz is, is well published um, and cited all over the place, um, I'm going to assume that a 30 is really good, um, but honestly, off the top of my head, I don't know what is a good uh, benchmark for each discipline. Um, I would refer you to, um, there's a quick, simple read on H index in um, Wikipedia, and, um, and it's got a small blurb in there with citations uh, that kind of summarizes um, Hirsch's assessment of what were good scores in um, each of the fields. So not trying to be wishy-washy there, but uh, yeah, it, it all depends is uh, kind of the short answer. Okay, so now we'll take a look at Web of Science. So if you recall here, he got a 30, if we wanna be a gen generous, a 31 for his um, score in uh, Scopus. Now, Web of Science um, basically does the same thing. It um, allows you to search for um, articles by a particular author. Uh, its time span goes way back, um, all the way back to 1900. So much further back than Scopus. Um, that said, it's pretty much exclusively journals and not conference proceedings. Um, so it is kind of limited in the types of publications covered. And let's see here, let me reset my form. It was saving my old one. So um, it's going to default to topic search. You want to change that to author. And then, um, oh, another thing that um, I like to point out is that um, with Web of Science, uh, it defaults to what's called the uh, Web of Science core collection. There are act, there's actually some additional collections in here that can be searched. I like to be as broad as possible. So my advice is uh, from this pull down is go to all databases and it will add some of these additional indexes like BioSys as a biomedical science, uh, biology and medical science database, Medline um, and several other indexes. So I like to change this to all databases Okay, and then um, when um, you select the field you want to search, they'll show you an example of how to enter it. So their advice is last name, first initial, and then a star. The star is what's known as a truncation key. So it will look for a string of letters after the first initial. So if he signed a paper is just N. Katarnabas, it should find that beside it as Nasser, it should find that so it should find all those instances. Okay, and so now we'll search. All right, and so we've got 311 matches. Um, and right now it's um, ranking them from newest to oldest. So um, kind of like with Scopus, to make sure that you're getting all of the entries that mention him, um, turn to this refine results column on the left-hand side of the page. If you scroll down, there's a section that says authors. 
So notice there's one that says Katarnavaz N301, and then there's Katarnavaz Nasser 35. So I wanna make sure that we are getting everything. And so I'm gonna click them both and then refine. Now 301 plus 35 should get you 336 documents, but you will see, uh-oh, timed out. Go internet. Okay, there we go. Um, you will see that um, it actually, so we were expecting 336 results, it's actually 304. So some of those were um, same article with different um, signatures, if you will. So they were basically duplicates. So it automatically filtered those out. So um, to get to the H index, uh, you will look to the right side of the page, the create citation report. So whereas we were getting, let's see, um, what was it? 300, um, I think 29 uh, publications in Scopus, it was actually hitting more. Um, this is hitting less. So um, here we're just getting 304. And let's see here, the charts are not filling out. <laughs> And that is probably because um, Web of Science is not accounting for um, conference proceeding publications. So I'm still thinking. And um, so we can see up here at the top more clearly his, his H index according to Web of Science is 28. So it's a little bit lower, um, but then it is, you can see from this graph, showing uh, some of citations per year. Um, it goes all the way back to 1986. So very um, long historical coverage there. So as I said, different tools produce different numbers. They're close, but still they're different. So um, the even if uh, Scopus and Web of Science were, let's say, strictly journals only, they both cover um, different sets of journals there. Um, as you will see, there isn't one that just covers them all. And then last but not least, we will go into Google Scholar. So no advanced search here. Um, they tend to do a lot of the work for you. Uh, you can just simply put in his name, your scholar's name, and let's see here. No, I'm not a robot. Chimneys. Okay, there we go. And once you get to um, your list of um, results. You just want to click on his name to get into his profile. Okay, and there we have him. Nasser Katarnavaz with UT Dallas, Biomedical Signal and Imaging, Real-Time Signal and Imaging, Machine Learning, etc. And all the way over here on the um, right-hand side, um, he's got um, a huge index of 44. So if you're looking for the best score, you can go with Google Scholar. Um, there are a number of reasons, though, um, why that is happening. Um, as you scroll through the publications that are listed, um, Google Scholar uh, tends to lump in books. Um, some people may or may not want that, but it includes those. It will include patents as well. Um, it is not the best at deduplicating, so that can kind of skew things as well. Um, nor is there any sort of filter to remove um, self citations here. So if you're going with Google Scholar, you've got to take it with um, a massive grain of salt. 
Okay, so let's see here. Let me see if I can um, share my, let's go back to my presentation. All right. Uh, so we've defined the H index um, and taken a look at how to calculate it with these different tools. It's pretty darn straightforward. Okay, but now let's look at um, some of the criticisms and shortcomings. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, H index is um, a field dependent metric, so it can't be um, compared across other disciplines. So uh, again, my example of the 25 in biomedical engineering isn't the same as the 25 in computer science. Um, and this, ex this often extends to fields underneath the same discipline. So sub-disciplines so sub within a discipline can be hard to compare. Um, that said, I refer you to um, a subsection on Wikipedia that, said, that talks about comparing results across fields and career levels. Um, authors can inflate their H index score relatively easily with excessive self citation. Um, as we saw, depending on the tool you use, um, that can be um, avoided um, within the case of Web of Science and Scopus. Um, you can use a filter for it or it automatically does it in those cases. Um, the H index does not adjust well for publications that have multiple authors. So authors who publish independently or with few co-authors usually receive an undervalued H index, while authors who publish with a large number of co-authors uh, tend to be overvalued. Um, H index also ignores the author's placement in an author's list if there's multiple authors on an article. So in certain disciplines, this can be very significant. So um, it kind of ignores that impact there. Uh, as you saw, the H index is a natural number. Um, it doesn't come in fractions or decimals, so there's not a lot of nuance there or, or discriminatory power. Um, the H index does not provide, um, some critics have said that it does not provide a significantly more accurate measure of impact than the total number of citations for a given scholar. So in other words, it doesn't um, succeed all that well at merging quality with quantity um, of an author's works. The um, H index is also um, regarded as a slow metric. Um, by that, um, it takes um, uh, the longer the length of time um, that an author has been publishing, then the more that he usually benefits from the H index, the better and the higher it will be. Um, newer or younger authors, someone who's only been publishing um, a year or two, um, and hasn't had a lot of time to get um, recognition or citations from other others, um, usually get um, severely undervalued in their H index. And, uh, and then the last point I'm going to make here, um, the H index is limited in that it works very well for scientific disciplines, but it does a disservice to authors and scholars in the arts and humanities. So since it rigidly um, depends on journal and conference publications, um, it overlooks the impact of non-traditional sources common in the arts and humanities that would nonetheless signify an author's impact and influence. So for example, uh, blog posts, tweets, uh, message boards, um, other online digital artifacts um, all get ignored. So to remedy this shortcoming, um, many in the arts and humanities community and even in the scientific community subscribe to a philosophy of alt metrics, um, which just looks beyond the um, citation based metric of the H index and adds other factors um, for um, calculating impact. And that is um, a whole other presentation uh, in and of itself, so um, I will not be getting into a, to alt metrics, but I, uh, if that's something that interests you, I definitely um, recommend 
um, that you look into that. Okay, so um, we covered what it is, its benefits or intended benefits, how to calculate it, and, um, and then also some of its shortcomings. Um, again, very easy once you know where to go to calculate. So <clears throat> um, if you know where to go. Um, so um, that concludes uh, my presentation there. I'm ready to um, handle any questions that you guys, comments that you guys have. Questions, folks? That one student was asking about additional resources, and that's when we were talking um, earlier toward the beginning of your presentation. You mentioned Wikipedia um, as a place for more information. Are there other sources? Yeah, so for, for just a, a, you know, a quick, simple overview, and it sort of summarizes the pluses, minuses, controversies. Um, I definitely recommend Wikipedia. In fact, there's, um, there's a section in there with proposed um, ways that people have um, tried to tweak the H index. Um, one measurement is called the M measurement, where you take the H index as normal, but then you divide it by the number of years that the author's been publishing. Um, that's supposed to offset the um, the lopsided impact of someone who's published a long time versus someone who hasn't. Um, now, I'm no statistician or uh, mathematics expert, so I don't understand all the language there. Um, but if you want to see a, kind of a chart of different alternatives, those are listed there. Um, but I will also send out with from my, um, my notes from this presentation, um, my reference sheet. It's very short. Um, but there's a, an article that, um, that I cribbed a lot from, um, as much if not more than Wikipedia, called The H-Index Debate and Introduction to Librarians. Um, and uh, it, it does um, kind of a nice historical overview of the H-Index and, um, and then criticisms of it. And um, it really cautions against um, using that as, say, your, your sole metric of a person's impact. Um, but that came out in 2017, so it's, it's fairly recent, um, up to date. Um, and it's a fairly straightforward read, too, um, that, that kind of digs deeper um, in different spots than, um, than just a Wikipedia article does. But those would be much shorter reads. I mean, I, I could recommend um, some books on bibliometrics, but um, that, that is really getting deep into the weeds there. But yeah, I'll be sure to pass those on. So um, I'm assuming we can then email this, um, my documents out then to everyone who signed up. Yes, Matt, we'll be able to get that out. Okay, I'll great. coordinate with you behind the scenes. Okay, okay, great. Great job, Matt. Thanks for uh, sharing that with everybody.